All right. Oh, we own, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, here we are uh, with Dr. Liebenberg. Did I say that correctly? It's Liebenberg. I am. Lieben, Liebenberg. I, I apologize. Please excuse <laughs> no, me. No apology necessary. <laughs> yes, ma'am. But uh, we're here for the interview and everything. We're glad that you could be here and you're showing your interest in, in our position that we have open for superintendent of our uh, school system. Yes, sir. And we'd like to start off, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, give us a little brief history, a little rundown. Thank you. I'll try to keep it brief. I've been working all my life. I've been working since I was 14 years old, so I should have more stuff paid for than what I do, but sometimes <laughs> with children, that just doesn't work out that way. Ball feels off. <laughs> you know the deal. I started out in business. I started out as a branch coordinator for a major mortgage company at a young age, and I started right out from high school doing that, and I brokered multi-million dollar loans, and I was very good at it, and the money was good, so I said, no, I don't need college. I'll stay in this and do this. And I was very happy. I left there and was recruited by a law firm to come and be an office manager. And I thought, I really don't know anything about legal. And they said, don't worry. You've got a great head for business. You'll learn it. So yeah. I was responsible for one of the largest law firms in the Southeast. I was responsible for every aspect of money that came into that firm. So a little skidding kid was walking down with a purse with million dollar checks in it depositing them at the bank and then making the disbursements. It's crazy when I look at back at that and think, how in the world did something not happen to me? Young and naive. But I, was, <laughs> I was responsible for all the money. And then I was responsible for the partner distributions. And that in a law firm, you look at how much money they grossed every year. And then you divide up the firm percentages of ownership, which translates to their percentages of paychecks. And so that was um, very interesting response for all the financial statements, the payrolls, the hiring, and unfortunately, sometimes the termination. I love that job. I had a corner office, but below me was Advent Episcopal Day School. And I started volunteering at Advent Episcopal Day School during my lunch hour. And I was going to Birmingham Southern College at night. And I followed my heart and I left the firm and followed my passion into education. I was a student at Birmingham Southern and I was offered positions at Jefferson County, Hoover and Homewood. I chose Jefferson County because I had the opportunity to teach at the school where I attended. So that was just something to sit in the classroom and teach where you used to sit in that classroom with Miss Howard, a teacher that was my teacher. You know, that was just it, it was just monumental to me. One of my favorite moments. I was uh -huh. teacher of the year my first year. By my third year, I was recruited by one of our Blue Ribbon schools. And I said, oh, I don't think I'm supposed to transfer before I have my tenure. And she said, Pam, you're fine. And that year, I obtained my National Award for Professional Teacher Certification. I was the first one in Jefferson County to receive it with middle childhood generalists. So that was back in 2001, I believe. That was a big hoo to hoo I remember they had cake and the media was there. I was blown away by that. <laughs> that kind of, you know, now there's no big hoo to hoo about it. I, I became Brian Elementary's Teacher of the Year, and then I became their uh, PTA Teacher of the Year, then the district's PTA Teacher of the Year, and then the state and national PTA Teacher of the Year. So I had a lot of success and good rapport with my parents. I left Bryan Elementary School to go and teach at a middle school because I wanted the opportunity. It was a junior high school, Bagley Junior High, and I taught math and science in the middle school setting. And I, I left because I was recruited by Jefferson County for their administrative program. My superintendent and assistant superintendent said, Pam, we haven't seen your name coming across on any applications. And I said, for what? For an admin. And I said, oh, no, I'm never going to be an administrator. I love teaching. <laughs> <laughs> they, they mm -hmm. talked me into it. And and so I went to the dark side and I thought, oh, <laughs> I won't get a job for a long time. I see people that go into this and they're sitting in the classroom three years. I had signed a contract to be another mentor teacher, another national board mentor teacher. And my superintendent came to my classroom and this was the day before school started. And it was a Sunday and he said, why don't you ever answer your phone? And I said, I do. And he said, Pam, I've been trying to call you. And I said, we get no cell service here. He said, the board appointed you as assistant principal at Clay Elementary. And I said, oh, when do I start? I just met my class today. He said, <laughs> <"Day."> 
<laughs> and so I left everything and I had a whole classroom full of books, science materials, manipulatives, you name it, I left it. And so I went to Clay. I was the only assistant principal with 1,064 kids. And so it was definitely drinking out of the fire hose. And it was a great learning experience. I had a great rapport with Dr. Glant, my principal. And she had some issues with her mom being ill. So I was left in charge of the school a good bit of time. And she trusted me with that. So I'd run the school a day and she'd call me at night. And some things happen like lockdowns, uh, yeah, yeah. Get off on the, <laughs> on the wrong bus and triplets, but one triplet didn't make it home. All the, those great experiences. <laughs> You know, lockdowns being at Clay Chalkville High School, but no one telling us at elementary school. So protocol was changed because of that. My deputy super said, Pam, you're not supposed to call me. I said, hey, I wanted to let you know we're putting the school into lockdown. And so he said, we don't have that policy. And I said, no, you might want to look into that. <laughs> I loved it at Clay and I wanted a principalship position. And I talked with Dr. Pouncey at the board, the superintendent at the time. And I said, I really want and, you know, what am I missing? He said, Pam, you have all the skills. We just don't have openings. We don't want to lose you. He said, but it's going to be a two and a half, three years because of, again, it was a money issue. They have, they had a problems with another superintendent and money and, you know, those things happen. So I applied in Tuscaloosa County. And when I drove by the school, it looked just like my first school. It was Crestmont Elementary. I went to the interview and I just fell in love with the people. And I told my husband, I said, I believe that interview. He said, oh, no, Pam, I think you need to start packing your things. Well, I got I got the job and uh, we had such a great culture. They were going through a hard time and, and things happened that I didn't know about when I took the job. Their administrator had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Mm -hmm. And two months after I took the job, she passed. It was a very difficult situation. And we had to work together and collaborate and bring the faculty up. And we had such a good culture. They are still my family to this day because when I moved to Tuscaloosa, I know no one here. So we've had to build friendships and relationships. And um, I left them, which was the hardest job I've ever left to become director of curriculum and instruction for Tuscaloosa County for the Southern region. And that was 14 schools. And I was working on my doctorate at Sanford. And that's what I wanted to do was be director of curriculum instruction. And we had really great success in the southern region. That's all the schools that feed into Hillcrest High School and Sipsy Valley High School. Mm -hmm. And so we've had some of the highest academic scores. And I'm proud to say one of my schools, Big Sandy, is the first model PLC school in the state. And so we had great success. And this year, I have the whole enchilada. So I have all 34 schools as the sole director of curriculum instruction. And I have 30 OSR pre-K units which should be soon to be 33 OSR pre-K units if my grants go through as possible because pre-Ks change lives. I'm married to my husband, Marius. He served in the military, 18 deployments overseas. Most of the time I didn't know where he was. They wouldn't let me know. And now he's working in Birmingham for Air Med International and he's a pilot. So when people are hurt or they need rescued from their trips, he goes and picks them up. So right now he's in Missouri picking up someone and bringing them back home. Okay. Wow. I have two boys, Matt and Adam. Matt's a fireman and Adam works with a tree climbing service. And he sends me pictures and says, mom, do you see me in the tree? He did this yesterday and I'm in a meeting thinking, this tree is 200 feet. No, I don't see you. And then my colleague <laughs> comes over and said, hey, your son was in my yard cutting down the biggest tree I have, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> These aren't pictures any mom wants to see, but uh -huh. I know because both my boys love their jobs and that's what you want. I have one right. grandma, her name is Madison, and one dog who's good sometimes and not. <laughs> I'm a professional scuba diver, which in Alabama, mm. you don't do that. <laughs> it was one of the things on my bucket list, but uh, I, I've taken up golf and I've learned it's a lot of skill and I can just now get the golf ball over my house and I haven't broken any windows. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. And I enjoy reading and I'm pretty much a homebody. People think because your husband's a pilot that you have some kind of glamorous life. 
but you don't. <laughs> <laughs> when they're home, they want to grill out, sit out. We go to school events, and that's our date nights, going to school events, and we have a ball. Okay, that's good. awesome. Thank y'all for having me here again. Yes, ma'am, and, and thank you. And, and right now, we'll let the uh, board members introduce themselves. I think we did it informally before the camera started rolling. So, uh, Jeff, if you introduce yourself and I'm Jeff Gossett. I've been the one that's been contacting you uh, for all of it, getting all these kind of things together. Uh, I am the former board president. I, I've had uh, I was 22 years at Jacksonville City Schools as the band director there uh, before I retired. So uh, the, the school system means a lot to me. And when uh, the opportunity came to run for school board, I was lucky enough to be elected. So that's just a little bit about me. Uh, Marita, you're next. Okay. My name is Marita Watson. Um, um, I'm also a retired educator and I uh, feel blessed to serve the Jacksonville City community by being a member of the school board. And we're so glad to have you here, Dr. Lieberman. Thank you. Tell me, Pam. Mm -hmm. Sherry? Uh, Ms. Sherry? Good morning. My name is Sherry Laster and I'm going on my second year as a board member. And I am still in education. I, I, I'm not fortunate enough to retire yet, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I teach career tech at, in a, at a county school here in our area and I have a son that attends Jacksonville City. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you for teaching. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. And Mrs. Sims? Okay. I'm Jennifer Sims. I'm also a retired educator and welcome uh, to the interview session at this time. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. yes. And I'm Ed Kennedy, the president-elect, um, mm -hmm. currently working with Jackson Parks and Recreation Department. I've been employed with the school system as a teacher's aide and coaching, So, uh, and this is my fourth year as a board member. That's incredible. <laughs> board member of educators, that's, that is mm -hmm. in itself is incredible. You don't see that often. No, you don't. No, you don't. So, ma'am? That's, that's wonderful. That's what we all wish a lot of times in Tuscaloosa County that we had board members who have educational backgrounds because it does make a difference. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, we'll start with the interview. We have, we have approximately 10 questions that we have for you. Each board member will have two questions that they will ask you. We have about a five or six minute uh, time limit that we'll give you to give uh, answers to these questions, okay? Okay, and I will start off. Uh, so what do you consider to be the most critical educational and curriculum trends other than the current virus that we're experiencing right now with the pandemic and uh, that are facing school superintendents and board educations today? Since I'm in Tuscaloosa County, we're queens of doing more with less. We average about $4 per student when all of you receive about 83 per student. So we blended learning is a trend and we have to look at how can we have blended learning with 19,800 students. And it's just not our school system, it's all over. How do you make blended learning happen? If schools change and you have to have different shifts coming in your high schools, how are you gonna make this possible? How are you gonna make this happen? And if, sure really requiring us to think out of the box. There's also the trend of the whole child. Growing up, we never heard anything about whole child. Yesterday, I attended a wonderful PD that was free online. I worked with Dr. Greg Benner at the University of Alabama, who's an expert in whole child, and Melissa. And, and we look at ways that we can help our children with whole child and learning that we see that their behavior and the trauma that they have at home, it affects what goes on in the school. So I think that's another trend. And you see the trend of self-care, self-care not only for your students, but self-care for your teachers, for your faculty, because they come to school with issues as well. And so I think that's another trend. Professional learning communities, which that to me is it's just best practice and what you do in the classroom, how you bring your teachers together, talk about the student data. What do you do? What do you want the students to learn? Yes. You know, what do you do if they don't get it? How do you know when they've got it? And what do you do with those who do? And so we work a lot with professional learning communities in Tuscaloosa. And I think that is a very positive trend. 
the Literacy Act. And now you're seeing with the Literacy Act more and more, it goes back to those early years and the foundational years. And what can we do to make sure that our students are reading on grade level by third grade? And that's really causing educators, community leaders, and parents to look at things in a different way. And I think you're going to see more and more of that trend. And it's going to matriculate all the way up to the high school because our high school said, Pam, that's for elementary people. And I said, oh, no, it's coming your way. Mm -hmm. And so now you're seeing we just vetted, I just vetted the iReady program for Tuscaloosa County. That's what we decided to go with. And, and I'm also led the Literacy Act Task Committee. So we work together with all 34 schools and I have 27 reading specialists that we work with to see what we can do to help mitigate children so that we won't have the issue when they get to third grade that they don't know how to read or they're not reading on grade level. No parent wants to hear that. That's something that we want to work as hard as we can. OSR pre k so you hear more and more about the emphasis on early learning. I think that's a trend and I've seen it. I have the first OSR pre-K at a high school, which is wonderful because we had a hundred high school girls and boys that wanted to serve as aides in those classrooms. So we had interview processes for those students. And so they're obtaining early learning experiences. And when you see at first, my superintendent said, Pam, that is the craziest idea I've ever heard of. And I said, I think it's going to work. I said, if it doesn't work, you can blame it on me. <laughs> That's one of Liebenberg's ideas. I, I had nothing to do with that. But now it works. And he, he was teasing me the other day and said, I'm so glad I thought of that. <laughs> and and uh, digital literacy and, and coding and computer science. We have eight middle schools and six high schools. And we've made it happen this year. I headed the Literacy Act Task Force. And so this year, we're one year ahead of state compliance. So all of our middle schools will offer computer science courses, all of our high schools will. And then we're working with the elementary so that they become digital certified. And that's di digital citizenship because we have more problems of children, parents and adults not really knowing what they can and shouldn't post on the internet and the dangers of internet and keeping your child safe. So those are some of the trends that I see. ELL learners, we have 1,300 ELL learners in our system. Wow. And every year when we think that we're on top of it, we've hired three social workers and we work with University of Alabama and Indian Rivers to make that possible. And then a grant, it's just, it's very difficult because some of our children have never, ever been in school. When I was a principal at Crestmont, we have so many that I asked one of your professors from JSU, Dr. Eduardo Pacheco, to come. And he spoke with my faculty about the differences between cultures and Spanish because we never realized that. And so we always look for outside resources that could come in and help us manage the trends because I believe you have not because you ask not. It's not all money that makes it. If you have a good relationship with people in your community and with your local universities Correct. They, they're you've got in-house experts yes mm -hmm. okay um my next question that i have for you is um <clears throat> you know we're in a, a small community here in jacksonville and uh you know word travels fast and everything about certain situations so what my question to you is how would you keep us the board informed about what is happening in the school system what would be your procedures for doing that? Yes, sir. I think communication is paramount. I see the board and the superintendent as a team. It has to be a team. Are we always going to get along? I'm not a disagreeable person, so I would say yes. I like to keep my board members informed. If you don't want me texting, just let me know if I'm your superintendent. I won't text you, but I'll pick up the phone and say, hey, have you got a minute? I'll text and say, hey, have you got a sec? This is what's going on. And it's the same as when I was a principal. If there was a problem, my superintendent never found out about it secondhand. He knew right off the bat, whether it was a child going to, to the hospital in an ambulance or a lockdown situation that we had, he knew what was going on when. And as, as director of 34 schools, he always knows the same. 
And my board members know that if they have a problem, they call me, I'll call them and I look into it and I, and I always give them an update and say, hey, this is what happened. This is what's going on. We're going to keep working on that. If it's with a teacher, hey, I've gone by and checked in the classroom. I've checked with a student. I've called the parent because it's so much easier to get on top of the situation and to let it fester. That's something you ever as board members, you cannot wake up and say, Oh, well, I just found this in the newspaper. That's not appropriate, not appropriate <laughs> at all. And I also, as a principal, a weekly newsletter I sent to every one of my faculty members every Friday. And I also copied my directors so that they knew, so that they knew what was going on in the schools and realizing that all of you have jobs and you can't make it to every event. But there are some events you might be able to stop by for five minutes and have a cameo. And so I would let you know, hey, this is what's going on at our schools next week. You may want to stop by. When I was a principal, I would have a different month. We had a community relations program that we made at our school. And so we had different community members every month that we celebrated. So we built relationships. And I'm going to tell you, all I never wanted for anything. And we had nothing. Yeah. Crestmont is the second poorest school in our system we painted that school in one saturday for free with my university of alabama partners in crime <laughs> I, was, I was so sore i couldn't even move that day <laughs> but we painted the school my superintendent walked up and he said has the school always been white pam and i said remember i told you about that my husband was deployed and told me he said pull the plug don't do that he said, I Googled it. It's going to cost $27,000 to get it sandblasted if it turns out bad. And I said, it's not going to. <laughs> no, look ahead. <laughs> so I would keep you informed to answer your question. I'd pick up the phone. Yeah. I would text you. I would send you weekly newsletters and update just to let you know. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, since you're used to things here in Alabama, you know all about how proration works and all those kind of things. Uh, so if a system's budget were prorated 10%, uh, how would you go about recommending budget cuts and things like that? You know, we've already been working on that. Uh, yesterday, I was meeting with all my elementary principals about a summer reading program and what we can do. Tuscaloosa County, we're the masters of doing more with less, with only $3.99 per student to spend. So we really have to make our dollar stretch. First of all, I would get with my CSFO, and all of you to see what exactly the money situation is. I have looked on your website and I, I do, I did look at your financial situations and that's what any person would do. I would make sure that our LEAPS codes are correctly so that we receive all the money that we can back from the state that everybody's degree is accounted for. I would look to see that our units are intact and see where the growth was. And I think we need to have several of those meetings a year, maybe in December and in spring so that we can start planning. And you wanna do everything possible because you don't wanna cut a child's education. You don't wanna let your staff go. I've been that person with a cutback my first year being a principal and letting two of my teachers go because the board said, Pam, we can't pay them. And I said, but I know, and I, I said, I know next year I'm going to have the money by October. By October, they were able to come back, but it's, it's very difficult. I would also think outside the box and look at ways that we could save money within our school. For example, have Alabama Power come and do a walkthrough of our facilities to see, do we have anything that we could change, any light bulbs? We say you could save a lot of money in that aspect. Think of creative copying and cutting down on those expenses, looking at leases, can you lump some together? And then computer programs, that's what I've been looking at in our system. Do we have programs that we're just paying for and no one's using them? Or do we have programs we're paying for and only three or four teachers are using them? Or even worse, we have expensive programs and they're just not delivering the results. Are they not delivering the results because they're not being used properly or they just don't work? And I was able to secure with IXL, free IXL from March until June for 19,800 students because I called and spoke with this, the reps and dealt with the top people in California. So again, I believe that you have not because you ask not and don't give up. I came from a very poor 
household. And I learned early on how to make a budget and how to stick with it. And from there, I carried that on all the way through, even now. I, I just think you have not because you ask not. And if you ask people, they're willing to help you and do things. I look for grants and I'm a master at writing grants and, and getting that extra money. And looking at the CARES Act that with the federal money, with the federal money, we're planning to buy all the supplies for all the parents in our elementary schools because we've been hit hard financially. And so our parents won't have to worry about those expenses. Now it's gonna be bare supplies, but we've gone to Office Depot, made the list, and we're looking to do what we can do to help our parents and help our schools uh, buy the appropriate cleaning supplies. Digital, a lot of our digital for parents who can't afford digital, we're looking at alternative situations with them. And I was meeting with one of my principals last night about maybe having part of his school on late at night and having a room that students can go in and use so they can use the internet. So really thinking out of the box and make every dime stretch. And if it's title money, looking at that title budget and ensuring that that title money is being spent so that you get the biggest bang for your dollar. Textbooks, it doesn't always mean because you have textbook adoption money that you have to spend it on that. As right. you know, that can right. go to computer programs and, and different things. So making every dollar stretch before you ever let a teacher go or a faculty member is not where you want to go. Right. And being transparent, when I was with Jefferson County and they were taken over by the state, they never told us. They never explained. And I was a first year teacher and I was so happy. I had $500 in my teacher account and it was white cleaned. And they said, oh, the system got it. They never told us. And so I see the importance of transparency and being transparent and telling your teachers, hey, this may be tough this year, but we're going to stick it out and we're going to push through this and everything's going to be better next year. Right. Great, great. Uh, with, with your teachers, how do you build uh, the leadership in your school system uh, within that? And what makes it, what do you, what do you believe makes a good teacher? First of all, as a national board certified teacher, PTA teacher of the year, I know what good teaching looks like. I know what, when you walk into that classroom and you see those students engaged, whether it's preschool, elementary school, or high school, and it's not a compliance thing where children are sitting there and they're quiet. It's they're collaborating. There's peer tutoring going on. They may be out on the field coaching and they've got that connection going on. And building the leadership, you look to see what your teachers are interested in and what they're great at. I had a faculty member and my rule was if you go to a conference, you turn it around and you bring it back to our school and you give a 10 minute snippet that changed the entire culture of our school and it built teacher leaders as a superintendent. You can't do everything and you're counting on your teacher leaders. And if they're in technology, you put them in technology and you have them as a technology leader and maybe they're turning around different skills and different professional developments. My reading specialists are now working for the state, and I think the state's going to take some of them. So, you know, I told them, I said, I'm writing this glowing, bittersweet letter, but they were so nervous about presenting. They said, I've never presented for adults. And I said, they're a hard group. And I said, you can do it. You can bring it. <laughs> so it's, it's building that capacity and telling them that they can. And I said, right. I've heard if you mess up, everybody's human, but build that capacity and model what you want. If you want leaders, you've got to model, model that. And you can't ever ask a teacher or anyone else to do something that you aren't willing to do yourself. If you want them helping out and serving hot dogs in the concession stand, by golly, you better be in the concession stand and serving hot dogs with them. You're right. And he's on everything. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. So you've got to do what you want. What you want them to see, and what you want for them, you've got to model that yourself. Right. Okay. Um, number five. Okay. Okay. Mike. What about now? There you go. Okay, I'm back. Okay. Let's look at how we handle complaints from principals. Uh, when you have a, a, a principal bring you a complaint and that complaint is supported uh, with comments from parents and students, 
how would you handle that teacher's performance if the performance, the uh, issue is that they are not performing proficiently? Well, with 34 schools, I have a great deal of experience with that. And as a former principal of a Title I school, I also have experience with that. And first of all, you want to listen and you want to hear the principal out thoroughly. You want to hear if they've got complaints from parents and then from teachers. You want to hear you want to hear that or from students. You want to hear everything that there is. And then I turn around and we have a system of supports that I've worked to, to develop, which is a teacher mentoring program. And I would ask my principal, what has been done to support this teacher? Have, have you observed in this teacher's classroom routinely? Is this just a one-time incident or is this something that's happening all the time? Because it's up to us as leaders to grow our teachers to their full capacity. Teachers are rare now and it's very difficult to obtain your teachers. And so I would ask my principals, have you had a conversation? Well, no, I, I don't want to teach you well. Sometimes those powerful conversations you have to have and then follow through with a, a memo. Hey, listen, next time I come to your room, I'm going to be looking for better classroom management. And then the principal would also need to look for outside resources to help that that teacher. It may be going with class. And I, I've sent some of my teachers before to classroom organization skills that was by class and it didn't cost me a dime other than gas money and lunch money to pay for that. And then as an assistant principal, I had a mentor teacher book club for our new mentor teachers. As a director, I have professional development that I've written to help my teachers. And you want to continue to follow back with that principal. And then there may come a time where the principal says, well, Pam, I'd like for you to sit in with me when we talk with that teacher and then we talk and we say, you know, this is what we're looking for and this is what we're not seeing. We need you to do these things. And you stop by the teacher's classrooms. My teachers know who I am. I come by, I leave sticky notes. All of my 34 principals and assistant principals know me. Most of my teachers know who I am. And you work to support that teacher in every capacity. Now, if things don't go right, it's never a surprise to one of my teachers if we're having to let them go. And I am, I hate this worse than anything. I'm what I call the Grim Reaper because I'm the person from central office that gets the letters from the board meeting and I go and I sit down with the teachers individually with the principals present and give them their release of contract letter and it's, it's heartbreaking and they call me a softy, but I would want someone to do the same if it were my child. I've hugged their necks. Uh, they've sat on my lap and cried and I've just hugged them. And at that point, there's nothing legally that you can say. You can give them their letter and you have them open it up and read it to you. But that is always the last resort. We do everything possible to make it work. I have a list of mentor teachers that my teachers, if they're having a hard time, a principal calls me, hey, who, where can my teacher go to see a good math teacher? And I send them somewhere, whether it's someone in our school or someone in a neighboring school so that they're not embarrassed. And we do everything. Uh, one of my high school teachers said, Pam, I used to get 100 applications for a teacher. Now I only have 22 and I have eight positions. And so we really need to do everything we can to save the teacher. But in the long run, you have to do what's right for the child. And not everybody can be a teacher, unfortunately. It is a, it is a calling. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. My question is, how would you build community and public support? That is... I think, I think you've touched on it a little bit because... Uh, ooh. A lot. You've done a lot. I mean, <laughs> that's my that's my favorite thing. And I know. I can tell. <laughs> I love I love people, uh, and I'm a people person. And my husband is kind of part of the deal. I told them when I was principal Crestman, I said, "You just don't know it, but you got an assistant principal too." I would have a hard time a lot of times keeping janitors. They would change jobs and get better jobs, and that was good for them. And he would be off a of deployment and would say, Pam, what do you need? And I said, I need a custodian. So he would come to help me take out garbage. We had breakfast in the classroom. So you can only imagine how much we have. And my husband goes with me to all my things. We go to Hillcrest High School. We go to Brookwood. I'm so disappointed we didn't get to go to the play because of COVID-19. 
we go to band at Christmas. Our Christmas dates are going to the University of Alabama with our school's band performances because we don't have a facility large enough for them to perform. We show up at various events, art shows, art judges. It's easier if my husband is the art judge <laughs> and he loves it. And that way I'm not in trouble. <laughs> so it's kind of a package deal. <laughs> if he's in town, he's like, what are we doing today? And football games, football games, he, he's just, he's always amazed by the compassion that teachers have. He said, I didn't have this when I was growing up. He grew up um, in another country and he just says, he said, I'm just blown away. And he said, the compassion that teachers here have, he said, I could have been a rocket scientist with this. <laughs> and so you would see me in the community. You would see me, I'm the same person wherever I go. Now you might see me, I won't be pulled. I'll have a ponytail and probably a baseball cap. I'm a huge sports fanatic. And so if I had my dream job and wasn't in education, I'd probably be working for ESPN. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, you know, my kids grew up at the ballpark and I just knew I'd have a professional ball player. You know, every parent thinks that. <laughs> <laughs> Reality, not so much. But you would see me in the community. You would see me at your schools. You would see me walk around. Your teachers wouldn't be, oh, who's that? They, they know me. And my teachers come up and say, hey, Pam, I don't have a problem with that. I'm a real person. I tell them I put my shoes on the same way you do. I, I'm not, it is what it is. And so I go to the lunchroom. Most of the time I don't eat lunch, but I do have an affinity for ice cream. So I may sit with your principals and eat a popsicle. That's my weakness and, and talk with them. So they, they know who I am. My principals know who I am. They call me, they text me. I just, I make myself part of where I am. Like I said, when we came to Tuscaloosa, we didn't know anybody and nothing. And you think University of Alabama, I had never been to an Alabama football game even, <laughs> came here. And so that would be the hardest thing would be leaving Tuscaloosa and starting over somewhere. But we've done it and I know we can do it again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, moving on. I think you've touched on this as well. You've uh, mentioned uh, in your discussion the number of programs that you've uh, engaged in. So what if there was a, a, a program that you strongly believed in? You know, it's educationally sound. <laughs> the board may have some disagreement with the program. How would you handle that? What would your reaction be to that, to the board and to how maybe you can... Uh, uh, encourage them to buy into your program? Well, first of all, I know the, the roles. I work for all of you. And so I don't have a problem with that. If it was something I was really passionate about and believed in, I might say, hey, can I have the opportunity to present this to all of you? Because there may be some discom, uh, you know, uh, well, I had heard it was this, I had heard it was that. And then after that, if you, all of you don't like it, I'm good with it. Move on <laughs> next chapter. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next question will be mine, right? Um, mm -hmm. What would be some of your ideas to expand the career tech program here in Jacksonville City? As you know that all our little precious ones are not going to go to a four-year college, but some might be interested in technology or uh, a community college. What are some of your ideas that you would have to expand what we have here at Jacksonville City Schools? My husband was career tech, and so I'm a big advocate of career tech. Both of my boys are career tech people. My mom was cosmetologist. She learned her. I was her practice dummy, so I had some good haircuts and some really bad haircuts. Ooh, and, and when I was wanting to be blonde, I, I learned about it at turning green or turning real white or even breaking off, so I was her favorite student ever. <laughs> so with, I noticed that when I looked at your high school that you have four career tech options and career tech options are built based on, in Tuscaloosa County, we did it. We have, um, I have someone that's fabulous, Dennis Duncan. And I always talk with Dennis Duncan. I said, how did you do all this? This is amazing. He said, Pam, what run wasn't built in a day. And so the first thing I would do was meet with you, with all of you, meet with our community leaders. What are the needs of this community? What are the needs of the businesses? what are the opportunities that we can get and have buy-in? 
we have alternate certification and practices. How can we get some of these in with our welders and our welding programs? They weren't teachers. Uh, my letters from Crestmont Elementary, I was Tuscaloosa County High's first paying customer because I said, we need letters for our school. And it was the greatest feeling ever to see those kids come over and hang the marquee that they made. And so I would work with your Chamber of Commerce. I would work with Calhoun County. I would call your other systems because it is a team approach. It's not what you have sometimes. It's what everybody else has. Tuscaloosa City and Tuscaloosa County are big rivals. We're always trying to compete with each other. You know, they're the city, we're the county, and but we work together. Jefferson County at Brookwood High, Jefferson County comes and uses our department, Career Tech, and they send their students. Selma sends some of their students and VIP. So it takes that working. I would work with Calhoun County. I would call Talladega Career Center. I would call Anniston Career Tech Center and say, hey, what do you have? Can some of our students come over there? If we provide transportation, can we have them? And see, we have two career tech centers in Tuscaloosa, and it took a long time to raise the money for that. And in between, we used facilities with Tuscaloosa City, Tuscaloosa County. I'm Worlds of Work certified. I worked with our Chamber of Commerce and I participated. It took over a year to gain that certification where we visited the different businesses and we found out what the businesses need. And one of the problems they're having is something simple and we're working on it with all of our schools. Kids aren't accustomed to coming to work and being on time. And then mm -hmm. business leaders told us when we correct them, we have an altercation or they go and file something on us and say, hey, my boss is picking on me. So we're working on, in our career tech programs, they have a time clock they punch. And I was talking with my friend who's a superintendent at Selma City. She said, Pam, we're starting with our seventh graders so that by the time they get to 10th grade, they're accustomed to that. And also bringing in the community and bringing in mentors, Dennis Duncan, we have a WOW 2.0 and it's at Shelton State and it's grown every year, but different businesses come and they see, oh, I have a chance. I could do this. I can sit in this truck. I can be a fireman. I can be a hairdresser. I tapped a vein. My mom would so, be so proud of me because I'm squeamish. I've gotten over that as a principal, but I learned how to do it at our career tech. Mm -hmm. we have mock interview days for our high school students. And so that would be one thing that I would, that's easily to put into place. So as your superintendent, if I were chosen, I would work with your businesses, your community leaders, and see where they can help us to build career pathways, hospitality, tourism, biomedics welding, carpentry. We have a carpentry teacher that is fantastic and has kids building frames and they're building, you know, this is a country, so they're building houses for hunting and you name it. And so it, it's incredible, but it all starts with you asking people what they want to do. When I was at Clay Elementary, our mayor taught students how to be brick masons. And who would have ever thought that? Right. Very right. good. Dr. That Lucy. That's very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, what would you consider to be your greatest administrative strengths? And on the flip side of that, your greatest administrative weaknesses or some of the administrative weaknesses you might see in yourself? Uh, my strengths, I'm a people person. I can relate well with everyone, talk well with everyone. I have been the poorest of the poor child growing up. I'm the first one in my family who's obtained a college education and I value that and I value school and I know what a difference in my life it's made. I think my strengths are to build capacity, to build leadership, to have the ability to not tell people what to do, but to take them where you want them to go and to build connections with community leaders, connections within the school to build relationships. I'm, I'm a people person and I have the ability to listen. I believe that you have two ears for a reason mm -hmm. and you have to have an open mind because somebody may tell you something that you didn't ever see it that way. You think, ah, oh, if I would have had a set mindset, I would have never known that. Weaknesses, that's easy. I'm goal and career oriented. I make two goals every year and I stick to them. 
my mom in 2018, it was, school was just starting back. And I told my superintendent, I said, I've got to take off a couple of days and take mom to the doctor. Something's wrong. She was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer and only given months to live. And we, my brothers moved her to Chicago so that we could you know, have medical treatment there. During that time, I was coming home from work and I was involved in a car accident. A, a lady T-boned me and it hit me driver's door. And I walked away from it, but I had a serious concussion and my doctors would not permit me to travel, to leave home, anything. They put me on the same football protocol. So I have a respect for any football player with a concussion. My last conversation to my mom was that I would get my doctorate. I was on chapter two when all this happened. And so 2019, my New Year's resolutions were to obtain my doctorate. And I had promised Big Sandy Elementary School that they would be my first model PLC school, professional learning community school. I obtained my doctorate 10 months later. And let me just say every Monday through Friday, I do school stuff. In the evening, I don't do personal stuff because you're you're spent. And so every Saturday and Sunday, sometimes for 16 hours a day, I did nothing but write, rewrite, work on my dissertation. And I would look at mom's picture and know I promised my mother I would be Dr. Liebenberg for her. And there were times that I wanted to pack it up and quit because it was it was terrible. So, so then, then do you think your weakness is um, being too driven? Is that what you're saying that your weakness? <laughs> I think I am very, yes, I think that is a weakness. I'm very, I'm dri very driven mm -hmm. and, and, you know, at all costs. And I'm thankful that I have a husband that understands that and that right. supports me because right. not every man would support their wife sitting in a computer for 16 hours. That's <laughs> true. That is true. Work. So that's, that's my weakness. I'm, I'm driven. If I tell you I'm going to do something, it may almost kill me, but I'm going to get it done. So right. That's well, and, and thinking about Jacksonville City Schools, uh, what is it about our school system and what is it about Jacksonville? In other words, why are you interested in this position here with us at Jacksonville? Jacksonville appeals to me. I love the small town. I love that it is a school system built around a university, a teaching school system. When I was at- Well, you've got that now, don't you? With well, being in Tuscaloosa. Yes and no. Now we have all the student teachers that we can get and we take them all, but we don't have that true teaching partner school. I love the teaching school. And when I was principal at Crestmont, we held classes and at our school with our education majors. And we kind of reorganized the schedule so they could have the library some days or they can have the lunchroom and they worked with their kids. So I've worked really hard to get to where I am and I would like to go somewhere where I feel like I can make a difference and, and help all of you. And I think that I would bring a lot to the table. I would be able to help you with your career tech pathways. I think I would work well with all of you. I'm not a disagreeable person. I'm a pretty much easy to get along with person. And I think that just the small town appeal and the appeal of working with a board that's comprised of educators I've never heard of that. And in 23 years in education, I've never had that. In Jefferson County, I think we had a couple of educators, but that's rare. And you, all of you would get it when I explained, hey, they, they didn't meet this goal, but we're going to tighten up and we're going to look at this and how we can differentiate the instruction. Or we have a coach that's really bringing it. Can he show some other coaches who are having a hard time? You all get that just i i just think it would be a unique opportunity i think it's a place that my husband and i would be very happy with and it's it's really we've calculated the difference you know, as long as we kind of move close close uh -huh. to the interstate it's an hour and 20, 12 minutes for him to get to birmingham from where we live and it'd be it'd be the same i mapped it out and looked <laughs> <laughs> so you're playing uh, that good I just Thank think you. that I would be an asset to your school system. And I think that all of you would be a tremendous asset to me. And I think looking back, you've produced some outstanding superintendents. I can't say enough about Dr. McKee. And when I called the state department, uh, I went to his, his first day as he was sworn in as superintendent and he has the best boys. They were in front of me in line and just good people. 
And Dr. Davis, I could call her and say, hey, what if, can we do this and this and this? She goes, oh, yeah, Pam. And <laughs> Don Stevens, Dr. Jones. And so I just, I just think it would be a good fit. But I will say this. I know all of you have a tough decision to make. I know with COVID-19, nothing is normal. And I know that if you need to stay within house, I understand and I respect that. If you look outside and if it's not me, I understand and I respect that because it's important that all of you select somebody that you get along with and that you feel like is best for your system. But I just want to thank you. This has been a unique experience. I know that in 10 years back, I will look at this and say, I remember the interview I had for mine. <laughs> yes. And it's unique for us also. This Who knows? Is, this may be the new norm. We don't know. <laughs> my husband, hopefully not. No. No, hopefully not sure. <laughs> it was a pleasure meeting all of you. Yes, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you and have you answer all the questions too. Uh, board members, do you all have any more comments or any more questions? Anything? I have one additional question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I would like to ask you how you would uh, close that achievement gap. You know, we have those uh, that are not quite meeting us. I know you've talked about it in making some other statements, but I would like for you to address it specifically, how you would close that achievement gap. I have your, I, I do have, um, this is the nerd in me. See, I have a binder. <laughs> yeah. And see, I have your data. I have your Scantron. Yeah. You know, I looked at your, I looked at your ability groups and I've, I've printed it all the way through to high school. I look at your current 2018-2019 Scantron with 48.9. It was an increase and then you have a decrease. I noticed that your ELL population is improving. I noticed that in its, in its usual, the female population does a little bit better. I noticed that some of your African-American population aren't there. Po poverty is performing below. Right. Okay. I, I don't believe that it's poverty that makes students. That's a mindset and it's right. a growth mindset and it has to come from top down. Do mm -hmm. not say these students can't do this. No, all students can perform and it's your expectation. So I would work with a faculty to know that they have that growth mindset that expectation i have higher expectations for everyone i tell them i said i was the poor kid i was the kid that you would have snubbed and said oh that's pam she doesn't have anything she comes from a poor poor family right but and instead i had teachers they didn't cut me any slack and that's the same way i feel you have to look at your data see where your groups are and then look to see is this coming from a particular grade level what are they doing to differentiate their instruction mm -hmm. and do they know how to differentiate their instruction all right and then in high schools they'll say we don't di differentiate Liebenberg. that's for <laughs> elementary i said oh no baby it's coming your way and then you show right. them right. that it can and then uh, one of the things i did when i was principal I had Eccles Middle School come to my school for instructional rounds. And that's another thing, instructional rounds, be a part and know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And Eccles, the eighth grade teachers, they never realized how much we bring it in the elementary schools. And then when you go to the middle schools, now our middle schools have instructional rounds with our high schools. So they see that practice and what's going on. And so it's a matter of looking at your data, seeing what your subgroups are that you need to work with, and how are you working with them? Are you right. having bail to bail instruction? And right. the excuse is, oh, they're just from the projects they can't. Well, I'm here to tell you that's no excuse because they can and they will and they do. My school was, when I came to that school, they asked me, my superintendent said, do you have any idea of what you're getting into? And I was offered a job with a prominent school system in North Alabama and offered this job at Crestmont. Mm -hmm. I took Crestmont because I just love the way it looked. And I am excellent at working with poverty students as well. And that's my passion because I was one. Okay. Thank well, you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Good job. Good job. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, board members, are there any more comments or questions, any remarks, anything that you have? Yes. Candidate. One more. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, at the end, you uh, addressed uh, that uh, come. You would like to come here, and you could make the transition. 
But as I think about all the resources that you have so close to you, where you are, the size, how the transition would be great. We only have two schools. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So how would you deal with that? You are very energetic. You have all of these things going and you're accustomed to doing so many things. How would you bring that in to deal with two schools? Oh, I think I can get a lot of stuff started with your two schools. <laughs> you mentioned career tech. I believe I could entertain some of your businesses in the community. And if possible, if any of you would want to go and meet people, I think that would work hand, hand in hand together because two schools, you still want excellent two schools and you want all the resources that you can get for your two schools. And two schools, once you're bringing it and you have so many different programs, guess what? You build it and they will come. Field of Dreams, one of my favorite movies. You build it, they will come and you have more. And, you know, I think it's important we work on teacher retention, recruitment, and communities are built around schools. We're Northport. I'm in Northport now, and we can't get schools big, built quick enough, and it's because the schools are excellent. And okay. we work in feeder systems. I would I would find plenty to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would be a part of the schools. Your two schools, when they have instructional rounds, I would come to their instructional rounds. I would go visit teachers' classrooms. I sit down and read with kids. I sit down and, and have art with kids. They don't want me singing because my musical <laughs> is not, not good. I had to sing at Christmas in front of everyone. And so my <laughs> prince was like, Pam, oh, that was just a musical snack. We need you to come over. <laughs> it was terrible. They set me up for the fall. They were supposed to be singing with me. And they dropped it. It was just me. Oh, yes. In front of all my principals and teachers. Beautiful. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. That's so, wonderful. Thank I, you. I imagine that all of you would have projects that you would want me looking into and, and working on. And just to get your career tech program going in pathways, that's yeah. going to take an enormous amount of energy just to have something like Worlds of Work 2.0, where your juniors come and have mock interviews, have it built. And it will take several years to get all that with the community buy in, and it grows and grows. And now on Dennis Duncan, he said, Pam, I had X amount of seniors that got jobs from this. And so I would I would keep busy. I'm not good with not keeping busy. Okay, Dr. Liebenberg, we currently do participate in World of Works, our seniors do. And then our seniors have what's known as the Pinnacle Project. And we also do mock interviews. So there there are certain things that we currently do have in place uh, for our students. Oh, I love that. I think that's wonderful. One of my students that I interview works at Starbucks, and I saw we are getting a Starbucks, and yes, can't go in there. And I, I have to tip him because I just fell in love with him. His interview is so sweet. He was a a kid who had a hard time, and he's turned everything around and made a success. And uh, it's it's great. I love the interview process. I'm glad to hear that y'all have that, and I think that we could work together and and really build on things and build on what you have. Okay, thank okay. you. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, do you have any more comments for us? Uh, we're nearing the end of our interview and everything. Just have a few more minutes. What would you be looking for in a superintendent? What would be my measuring stick for my success if I were chosen as your superintendent? I don't know. Are you asking about an evaluation process? or I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. We do have an evaluation, and we base that on uh, AASB, the Alabama Association of School Boards um, criteria and their instrument that they have recommended. So, you know, that would be given to our superintendent prior to the evaluation to make sure they understood what the parameters were and what the uh, what were the expectations were. Mm-hmm. I love it. Educators. Yes. yes I, love it. <laughs> I, I love that. That's that's refreshing. I love that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It was a pleasure meeting all of you, and thank you for taking time out of your day. I know this was unusual, but I took a vacation day today, and I never take one of those. And I understand that. (laughs) You needed this. You need this time off. Yes, yes. I thought a vacation day would be good. I have a a big day tomorrow, so 
So okay. I'm going to go and, and now that stores are kind of open here, I may don my mask and go visit. Kind of right. Go, <laughs> right. Go right ahead. Thank you all. And okay. have a great afternoon. Y'all have a yes. great day. I enjoyed yes, it. Well, we certainly have enjoyed you and thank you for taking the time to interview with us. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Y'all have a great day. Okay. okay. Right. You take care too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye. Bye, -bye. Mm-hmm.